Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. and Martha Scott in third finger left hand. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In times of stress in the world, there's more satisfaction than ever in the job of producing plays for the Lux Radio Theater. That's because trouble knits families and nations closer together. And we know that for one hour every week, a great family that sprawls across the whole continent turns its ears to this stage. Farmer and businessman, shipbuilder and aircraft worker, soldier and sailor, mother and dad, all of you who lend us your ears. Our job is to make you laugh, to stir you with drama and bring us all together in a spirit of friendship and goodwill. Tonight we have a gay comedy. And comedy is something the doctor orders for all of us in times like these. And it's doubly welcome when our stars are such charming and talented players as Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. and Martha Scott. The play is third finger left hand. Those words may suggest the place where the gentleman always puts the lady's wedding ring. But don't let the title of this Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer hit fool you. In this romantic comedy, Martha Scott puts the ring on her own third finger left hand then makes up an imaginary husband. And when the debonair Mr. Fairbanks turns up claiming to be the husband, the situation is a bit too much for Martha, even though she is the smartest businesswoman in town. They say it's only the married women who know how to mix business and romance, because it takes intelligent buying to run a happy home just as it does to run a business. And one of the keys to that secret is Lux Toilet Soap. My grandmother down in Washington, North Carolina, once told me that during the war between the states, she had to make her own soap. She said it was hard work and the finished product wasn't anything to get excited about. But perhaps women in those days didn't really know what good soap was. In fact, if I could have shown my grandmother a cake of Lux soap and told her how little it cost, Grandma would probably have fixed me with a reproving stare and suggested that I tell that one to the Yankees. Lux Toilet Soap would have been a miracle then, and perhaps it still is. When Bill Powell and Myrna Loy were overtaken by a touch of flu last week, we canvassed Hollywood to find the stars who were best fitted for the leading parts in Third Finger Left Hand. Our first choices were Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Martha Scott, and fate was very kind because they were both available. Now we raise the curtain on the first act of Third Finger Left Hand starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. as Jeff Thompson and Martha Scott as Margot Merrick. Smart, the magazine for the smart woman, is exactly what its title indicates. And smart is the word for its business office, a modern panorama of black leather chairs and chromium fixtures. Smart is also the adjective for its editor-in-chief, Mrs. Margot Merrick. But you'll have to add, very young, very pretty, and very wise. And to be accurate at the moment, very busy. Now, please, Mrs. Merrick, about this layout. Now, please, now, about this... Please, please, I'll take you one at a time. Hello? Oh, hello, Philip. Yes, I'll have time in a minute. Come on in. Uh, Mrs. Merrick, this border... Steve, you're a wonderful printer, and I know it's spring, but put the forget-me-not borders on some other magazine. Try them on the editor of the Mining Engineers Monthly. But Mrs. Merrick... Martin, I, I want you to wire Chicago and hold publication one day. But we can't. Hello? Yes, send it in. I'll okay it. Look, Mrs. Merrick, a day's delay... Means I show the spring collections a month ahead of the other magazines. Well, that's no trick for a clever executive like you, Martin. You'll work it out, I'm sure. Yes, Mrs. Merrick, of course. Now, everybody outside, please, I'll see you all later. Mrs. Merrick? Yes, Jane? Mr. Booth is here. Oh, send him in. Come in, Philip. Hello, Margo. Sit down. Sorry to keep you waiting, Philip. I'm really up to my ears today. Oh, that's all right. I never mind waiting for you. Oh, uh, did you bring the copyright waivers, Philip? Right here. Two copies for you and two for the author. Leave them and I'll check them over tonight. Oh, Margo, are you giving me the rush? But, Philip, of course not. Come in. 
Mrs. Merrick, I... Uh, uh, yes, uh, Merton? Uh, Mrs. Merrick, on, on behalf of the staff, we, uh, we wanted to... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, uh, well, this is your first wedding anniversary, and uh, we, uh, we got you a desk clock, and here it is, and I hope you like it. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you, Merton. That was sweet of them, wasn't it? Uh, yes, now, Margot, <laughs> now that the subject's come up of itself, don't you think you ought to talk about it? Your marriage, I mean. Oh, Philip again. Well, you've got to take steps. You can't go on tied to a husband who doesn't even care enough to want to see you. Oh, but he does. I'm sure he does. Yeah, certainly he's got a fine way of showing it, wandering all over South America. He hasn't seen you since your honeymoon. Philip, dear, I'm trying to work. Oh, but this is important, Margo. He couldn't care about you and stay away. I got a letter from him this morning. I think this would convince even you how Tony feels about me. Where is he? Well, the letter's postmarked for... Oh, um... Well, what's the difference, Philip? Oh, Margo, it's your life I'm talking about, your, your happiness. Philip, if you'll promise to stop being jealous and go away to your law office and let the lady alone, she'll have lunch with you and we'll talk it all over then. Agreed? Oh, well, all right then. One o'clock, the Parker Grill. And try to be on time, will you? I'll be there. Don't worry. Bye. Bye. Yes, Jane? Mr. Winker would like to see you. Send him in, please. Good morning, Margo. Good morning, Gussie. If you have time, Margo, you could look at these layouts now. Please. I uh, don't know whether I should or not, Gussie. You're huh? in the doghouse with me today. I am? Why? You darn near got me in a beautiful jam with this, the letter I got from my husband. Oh, is something wrong with it? Well, uh, people might think it a little odd that it's addressed from Cuba and has a Brazilian stamp on the envelope. Oh. <laughs> You've got to be more careful, Gussie. You'll make an awful liar out of me. Margo. Someday, somebody is going to find that out. Oh, don't be silly. No, no, it's serious. I, I'm worried, Margot. I, I worry a lot about it. Well, you're wasting your time. What could possibly happen? Well, I'm not sure, but I have a funny idea that we could be sent to jail for this. Oh. Writing all those letters for you, signing somebody's name. I bet it's forgery. Nonsense, Gussie. You sign them Tony Merrick. Well, there isn't any Tony Merrick. So how can it be forgery? It isn't a crime to invent an imaginary husband. Well, if somebody found out, it could be mighty bad, Margot. Oh. You, you never should have invented Tony Merrick at all. I had to. You know that. Now, look, Gussie. How long has any unmarried woman lasted as editor of this magazine? Uh, six months. Six months. And do you know why? Because our dear publisher's wife has a jealous disposition. Remember the cable you sent me in Rio last April telling me I'd been appointed editor? You said regrets at the end of that cable, <laughs> if you'll remember. You knew nobody'd lasted more than a few months. Oh, yes, but I didn't think you'd come back from Rio with this story. If I hadn't, I wouldn't have a job now. Don't you see, Gussie? I, I'm safe as long as everyone thinks I'm married. My non-existent husband is my guardian angel, and I like it being guarded. But, but suppose your father should find out. Your father's so old-fashioned about such things. That, Gussie, is a risk I have to take. Now, stop worrying. Everything's fine. I'm on top of the world. <laughs> Philip, dear... I adore having lunch with you, but uh, don't you think you might talk to me once in a while? Uh, I'm sorry, Margot. You're in a mood again, aren't you? Oh, I'm not in a mood. I just feel puzzled about the whole thing. What's so puzzling? I still can't understand how you could have married a man like... like Tony Merrick. But you've never seen him. Nobody has. It's another thing I can't understand. I know. Sometimes I can't understand it myself. But there I was alone in Rio in April. Oh, it was romantic, I suppose. Madly romantic. It was uh, raining. The spring rain turning the pavements blue. Oh, I adore rain. And I detest it. Gives me head colds. Well, let's forget it then. Oh, but you couldn't have been in love with him. Or could you? Oh, I guess I must have been. It's raining. It's real. If you were in love, how could it have been over so quickly? It stopped raining. Well, why don't you get a divorce? It wouldn't be fair to Tony. But you don't love him. And he certainly doesn't care for you. Oh, but he does. Listen to this letter. You are the moon and the stars and everything beautiful. You, uh, so-and-so and so-and-so, so-and-so and so-and-so. Oh, so. What's that so-and-so? Well, if you really want to hear it. I adored you then. And now in spring with the sunlight, a spray of golden coins and champagne, I adore you even more. Your own Tony. Oh. 
He writes beautifully, don't you think? Oh, Margot. Mrs. Merrick. Yes, Jen? You asked me to meet you here. Oh, good heavens, the boat. Philip, I've got to run. I have to meet Lorna Maxwell's ship at four. What pier, Jane? 26. Well, what's the rush? Darling, she's terribly important. She's bringing me back some artwork. Oh, where's my purse? Do you know her stateroom, Jane? Oh, listen. Her letter said stateroom 4C. Well, come on. We'll just make it. Margo, when am I going to see you? Call me. Goodbye. Call you when? Goodbye. <laughs> But you're getting this stuff out of this stateroom, and you're getting out, too. Come on. Now, look, friend, I realize you're the third mate of this ocean-going bathtub, but you're not talking to a stevedore. And if it's all the same to you, I'll stay right here for a few minutes, huh? Listen, bud, for the last time, you're coming up on deck now and sign your card. Are there 20 passengers in line up there now? Yes. Will each one take 10 minutes? Yes. Couldn't I just as well wait here as at the end of the line upstairs? Yes. You could, but you're not. In the first place, you aren't even registered for this cabin. It's supposed to be a Miss Lorna Maxwell in here. Miss Maxwell is a friend of mine. She decided to stay in Havana, and she gave me her accommodation. Simple, isn't it? Yeah, but look at this report. Well, what's wrong with it? It's filled out, isn't sure it? Sure, it's filled out. Passenger, Jeff Thompson. Occupation, buggy whip salesman. Religion, druid. Distinguishing marks, small moan on wishbone. Funny man, eh? No. <laughs> no, I just thought maybe the immigration men get tired of reading the same stuff all the time. Well, they? they don't, see? And the customs men want to see you too, Mr. Thompson. You said you had nothing to declare. I haven't. Oh, no? What about all these pictures you got set up around here? You got to pay duty on anything you bring back, pal. There's no duty on works of art, pal. Works of art, huh? You don't think so, huh? What about this one, Lady in Red? Pretty, huh? Yeah, I've seen better pictures on calendars. Come on, hurry it up. Now listen. Suppose you'd hoboed around for years, washed dishes, worked on newspapers, trying to paint, and you were broke. And finally you got Mr. Big to look at your stuff. I'd let you stay. Uh, who'd want to look at this junk? Oh, nobody. Just the head of Flandering Galleries, that's all. He'll be here in ten minutes. Oh, an art expert, huh? No, he's a locomotive repairman I asked down to look into my watch. The hairspring's broken. A wise guy, huh? Now look, pal. You give me another half hour here, and I'll put in a good word for you with the head steward. I got orders to bring you up now, so let's go. All right, all right, Captain Bly, let's go. Lorna? Lorna, darling, where are you? This must be her stateroom, Mrs. Merrick. Look at the pictures. Oh! <gasps> And look at this one, Lady in Red. Oh, grand. Jane, try to find her for me, will you? Maybe she's up on deck. Oh! I beg your pardon. Forget it. It's nothing. Oh. Mm, well, very good. Very good. Lady in Red. Hmm. Would you mind telling me who you are? Open the window, please. I need more light on the pictures. They're very nice in this light. Please, you waste my time. Flandrin prefers no conversation when he judges work. Hmm. Does it impair your critical faculties if I breathe? Silence, please, or go and leave me alone with the work. Listen, if you think for one second that a painter who's a very personal friend of mine is going to come back with exquisite work like this and have a dealer like you gobble it up, you're mistaken. I honor the painter whose work I handle. For 20%? I know you dealers. Well, this work isn't for sale. I'll handle it. I've got all the contacts necessary, and I won't need 20%. Madam, I have no time to trifle with you. You bet you haven't. Now, get out of here, Shoe. What? I know you're kind off with you, Shoe. Get out. Very well. Good day. But I just found out. Miss Maxwell didn't take this boat. What? Well, she, she didn't, but... She left the boat at Havana. This cabin belongs to Mr. Thompson. Thompson? Oh. <laughs> Very funny, I'm sure. Would you mind letting me in on it? <laughs> oh, are you Mr. Thompson? That's right, Jefferson T. Thompson. How are you? <laughs> Mr. Thompson, the funniest thing in the world just happened. I just found out these were your paintings. I hope you like them. <laughs> well, I just shooed some art dealer out of here, and then I found out Miss Maxwell had left the ship, and... I knew these couldn't be hers. Oh, you deduced that all by yourself, did you? And did you also deduce the fact that it's taken two years to get Mr. Flandron to look at my work? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I know I shouldn't laugh about it, but really it was amusing. You should have seen his face. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> I just met him as he was leaving the boat. Oh, you did? Then uh, you know what happened? Yeah. And now let me tell you what happened. Mr. Flandron told me I could take my beautiful paintings and chuck them into the bay. Amusing, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, I'm awfully sorry. Well, goodbye now. Just a minute. You like riding in a bus? Uh, well, uh, 
Not particularly. Well, you're going to ride on one, see? Ride up to Madison and 40th Street to the Flandron Galleries, and you're going to get off there, see, and walk up some marble steps into a gallery and begin talking. Bye. So you see, Mr. Flandron, I'm here because Mr. Thompson thinks I was unethical to a competitor. <laughs> you see, Mr. Flandron, this young lady I'll here... tell him. I represent the Allison Galleries in Boston. We want his work, and you don't, What so... makes you think we don't want his work? Oh, you do? Well, then it's all settled. Certainly. Fine, thanks, Mr. Flandron. Of that... course, I do hope you're prepared to meet the price we quoted. What price? You remember, Mr. Thompson. We were, we were going to give you a, a $2,000 advance. Now, listen to 2000 I'll give him 2200 Why, that's wonderful. <laughs> Mr. Thompson, we'll advance you 3000 well, now, wait a Chicken minute. feed, 3500 You satisfied? Certainly I'm satisfied. My firm has authorized me to go to 4000 Now listen. 5000 and an exhibit all to yourself. And we'll raise that. No, no, no. I'll take it. I'll take it. Please. But I wanted to take you out to celebrate. Some, some place a little more... Uh, uh, Flossy or something. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thompson, but uh, I'm a working woman. A drugstore malt is all I have time for. Well, anyway, I, I do want to say thanks for fixing things up. You know, you were pretty swell about it. Oh, I was glad to do it. Two chocolate malts. You know, I... <laughs> I certainly had you pegged wrong. I took you for a society playgirl, one of those with nothing to do and a lot of time to do it in. Mm, not for me. I think every woman should have a career. I don't. Hmm? Well, just how do you like your women, Mr. Thompson? Well, this may sound old-fashioned, but I, um, I like them unsophisticated. And they're hard to find, too. Mm -hmm. And just where do you look? Well, not in New York. I see. You don't think much of New York, do you? No, it's all right, but, um, I like the Middle West better. I like the way they do things better. Mm -hmm. Now, you take, um, we'll take a malt of milk, for example. They don't know how to make a malt here. Some places make a, a milky malt, all milk and no malt. And, and there's other places that make a, a double thick malt, all bubbles and no body, you know what I mean? Mm. You uh, seem to have made quite a study of malts. Ah, well, I couldn't help it. My family used to own the corner pharmacy down at Wapakoneta. Uh, where? Wapakoneta. It's in Ohio. Oh, you come from Wapakoneta? Of course. I'm going back there, too, first thing in the morning. How nice. A visit with the old folks. That's right. Here, let me show you a picture. This is my mother on this side here, and uh, that's my father there. Mm -hmm. What's the blank space in the middle for? Oh, that's available. But she'll have to be quite a person to measure up to the people on each side of her. And that wouldn't be so easy, would it? No. Nope. No. Well, look me up when you find her. She ought to be worth seeing. I'll do that. <laughs> And you drop in and see us sometime after the furniture's all in and the house is tidied up. Oh, thank you. That might be fun. We'll all have a nice taffy pull. Well, I've got to go. Oh, now, wait. You can't run away. We've got to celebrate sometime, you know. What about tonight? I'm sorry. I'm busy. Well, tomorrow night. Very busy. Well, then, let's say Wednesday night. Look, uh, didn't you tell me you were leaving in the morning? That's right. I usually hate to change my plans, but, well, I'll make an exception. Well, all right. So will I. Fine. Tonight, then. No. Tomorrow night. <laughs> you know, for a man who hates to change his plans, you've managed to change yours pretty often. Oh, well, business, you know. <laughs> I wired the folks I'd be delayed a few days. Oh, I see. You know something? What? It's a very funny thing. What is it? Three days ago, I didn't even know you. Two days ago, I could cheerfully have wrung your neck. And now look at me. I'm even willing to try a rumba in a nightclub. <laughs> have I really changed your mind about, about New York? Well, not about New York exactly, but... Uh... You were so positive only two days ago. Ever seen Ohio? Only from a train window. Oh, it's great this time of year. You'd be crazy about it. Would I? Mm, it's full of clover fields and little hills and farms. And you can rent houseboats for $8 a month on the Ohio River. Float along with nothing in the world to do. Always wanted to do that. Why didn't you? Oh, that, that kind of thing's no good alone. You, you got to find a gal who sees it the same way you do. But uh, you never have. No, that is not until... Margot. What? Tell me something. What, Jeff? You like houseboats? 
Well, Jeff, I... Hiya, Margo. Oh, hello, Huey. How's the old business executive, huh? What do you hear from your husband, huh? Well, Did you find him yet? Husband, are you married? Well, uh, Is she I... married? Listen, pal, you're out with a very impulsive now... woman. Marry him quick and leave him fast. <laughs> very Tony American Rio and left him in a week. <laughs> Just impulsive. Oh, that's very interesting. Thanks for the lowdown, pal. Hey, what's the matter? Did I say something wrong, huh? Did I say something out of the way? No, not at all. Oh, yes, I did. I did it again. I did it again. I'm sorry, Mark. Jeff, listen. Why I... didn't you tell me? Well, I, w I was going to, but I, I was just waiting for the right moment. Yes, I can see it would be more fun to tell a man after he proposes. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Let's go. Uh, now, wait. Well, it was just one of those things. It was over in a month. I'm getting a divorce. I, I never was in love with what? him. What? Well, what'd you marry him for? Well... I was alone in Rio. We met in a doorway in the rain, and... Well, anyway, the next day, we drove to a little village, uh, Las Palmas, and got married. Well, the minute I realized the mistake I'd made, I left him. It, it was over in a week, and... Well, here we are. Yes, here we are. But you're not in love with him? Of course not. Fine. Then all we have to do is to get you a divorce. That's simple. Well, it would be with anybody but Tony. He keeps evading my lawyers. Oh, I could find him in ten days. Oh, no. He, he's in South America. I can still do it. A friend of mine is a foreign correspondent. A human bloodhound. He can find anybody. Have you got a photograph of this Merrick fella? Well, no. I, I didn't want to have anything to remind me of him. Well, give, him a, give me a description of him, then. I'll cable Joe tonight. I uh, doubt if your friend could find him. Oh, you don't know Joe. Yes, but you don't know Tony. Well, what's he look like? Go ahead. Well, he's... Uh... Oh, how old is he? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I never asked. Well, take a guess. 30, 35, 40, 45? Uh, 35. What color hair? Dark, dark hair. Brown, black, or gray? Gray. I thought you said he was 35. Well, maybe he's older. I, I don't know. Well, how did he talk? Did he, um, did he have any distinguishing accent? I don't think so. You don't think so? Oh. Well, don't you know? Didn't, didn't he speak to you, or wasn't he the quiet type? You needn't be sarcastic. I'm only trying to find out. Where did you say you saw him last? In Rio. But then how could you have left him in Las Palmas? Oh, well, that, uh, well, we were... Now, let's see. You uh, said you were married in April. Yes, April. You said May a minute ago. Oh, oh, so I did. Well, you see what happened... Although, as a matter of fact, you didn't name any month. <laughs> well, naturally, anyone would get mixed up when a person is deliberately stupid and suspicious. If you met him in Rio, and if you drove to Las Palmas the night... Uh, the same night and got married, you must have driven very fast. Trying to give me the third degree, eh? Because Las Palmas is 913 miles from Rio. Now then, if... What right have you got... Now listen, one more question. <laughs> oh, you know, you're one of the silliest men I've ever met. <laughs> really, you look awfully funny sitting there playing information, please. Do I? <laughs> In other words, this has all been very amusing, is that it? Terribly. And now, if you don't mind, I'll go home. I'll take you. Thank you, but you needn't bother. Better hurry back to Ohio and start floating down the river on that houseboat. Good night, Mr. Thompson. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Martha Scott, will bring us Act Two of Third Finger Left Hand. And now, here's a little argument that I overheard the other day. Two very young ladies were just leaving a motion picture theater, and as they walked up... Now, listen, Doris. You said how beautiful Loretta Young was in that picture. And I just happened to say we have a lot in common because my mother buys me the same soap Loretta Young uses. We've always used it at our house, so there. So there, nothing. That's just silly. Why, a big movie star like Loretta Young could afford to buy the finest, most expensive soap in the world. And it's you... It's as fine a soap as money can buy. My mother But you says... just said Loretta Young, that it's as fine, so It how... is as fine a soap as money can buy, and Loretta Young uses it, and practically every famous movie star uses it. And we always use Lux Toilet Soap, too. So does just about everybody I know, and it only costs a few cents. Lux Toilet Soap, is that it? Well, for goodness sakes, Marie, why didn't you say so? Lux toilet soap. Why, then I can eat... Yes, Lux toilet soap. That's the beauty soap Loretta Young uses, just as nine out of ten other famous Hollywood stars do. And that means something pretty important to you. For don't you think that the soap that cares for Hollywood's million-dollar complexions would be right for your skin, too? You'll find you can depend on gentle Lux toilet soap 
to help you keep your skin exquisitely soft and smooth. The kind of skin that wins romance and keeps it. You see, this famous complexion soap has creamy, rich, active lather that carries away stale cosmetics and every trace of dust and dirt. Gives precious complexions protection they need. Let Lux Toilet Soap give your skin gentle, thorough care every day. Let it bring new loveliness to you. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act two of Third Finger Left Hand, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., as Jeff Thompson, and Martha Scott as Margot Merrick. The very suspicious Mr. Thompson, suspecting that Margot's husband is non-existent, has sent a cable to a friend in South America. The reply comes quickly. Checked consulate. No passport issued, name of Tony Merrick. No marriage record, Tony Merrick, Margot Merrick. In short, no Tony Merrick. Armed with the evidence of Margot's fraud, Jeff Thompson presents himself at her home, a dignified colonial mansion with a dignified butler. Whom do you wish to see, sir? Is this the Sherwood residence? Yes, sir. Mr. Sherwood has a daughter, hasn't he? You mean Mrs. Merrick, sir? That's right. That's who I want to see, Mrs. Merrick. I'm sorry. She isn't at home, sir. May I ask who is calling? Mr. Merrick, Mr. Tony Merrick. Merrick, sir? Her husband? In the flesh. Well, uh, won't you come in, sir? Thanks. Uh, just sit right there, sir. I'll tell Mr. Sherwood you're here. And see if you can locate my wife, will you? Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Mr. Sherwood, sir. Mr. Sherwood. If dinner's ready, Burton, it'll have to wait for a moment. It's not dinner, sir. It's a gentleman look, that... Look, look here, Burton. <laughs> I've got a new specimen for my butterfly collection. Pretty, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Sherwood, sir. To you, it's probably just another butterfly, Burton. But it came all the way from Africa. A Lycana staciosa. Excuse me, sir, but Mr. Merrick's here. Lycana staciosa, one of the rarest specimens. Who? Mr. Tony Merrick, sir. Merrick? Margot's husband? Yes, sir. Where is he? Where is he? I want to see that young man. He's in the hall, sir. I didn't want to show the president. Oh, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Sherwood. How are you? How are you? I've heard a lot about you, Mr. Merrick. Yes, I suppose you have. Mr. Merrick, my daughter's happiness is very important to me. I think that gives me a right to ask you if you've come here to cause her more upset or to arrange a divorce. Divorce? <laughs> oh, I guess Margot didn't tell you, did she? Tell me what? Well, we, we talked things over long distance and decided that we'd been oh, kind of hasty in breaking things up and we're going to start over. You and Margot? Yes, everything's patched up. My boy, that's the best news I've ever had. Ah, oh, thanks, Dad. Dad? <laughs> <laughs> and wonderful, my boy. I'm tickled to death. Tickled to death. Burton, bring in a couple of highballs. Yes, sir. Got to have a drink on it, eh, son? Yes, I think we should, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sit down, sit down. Oh, does Margot know you're here? No, no, she, uh, she didn't expect me till next week. <laughs> oh, 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 we won't say a word to her. Just let her walk in and find you, eh? <laughs> Will she be surprised? Yes, I think we can depend on that. <laughs> well, 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 well. So you're the Tony we've heard so much about. <laughs> By the way, do you know that you and I have the same hobby? Uh, uh no. Y yes, no. I collect them too. Um, not really. Of course. <laughs> Bag them myself when I get the chance. But you're quite a hand at it, aren't you? Oh, well, um, you know how people talk. No, 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 none of that. Margot's told me some of the things you've done. But, of course, I'm a little too old now for those jungle forays. Oh, the jungle, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, indeed, the uh, jungle's the place. That <laughs> reminds me. I just got a magnificent, like, Canastasiosa from Africa. I want to compare it with the one you bagged. Oh, the, like, Canastasiosa. Is that, well, is that so? Well, well. Yes, <laughs> That's quite a story, quite a story. Uh, how big was yours? Oh, a big fellow. 
But you tell me about yours. Well, well, there's really very little to tell. In fact, um, <laughs> there's nothing at all to tell. Oh, no, come. <laughs> come, come now, my boy. Don't be modest. Followed him in the jungle, did you? Uh, well, yes, I, uh, I stalked him for hours. I was, um, I was just about to give up when, when I saw him. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Well, you see, he'd, uh, he'd been feeding on an animal he'd killed. Um, <laughs> an antelope. Huh? Yes, he, he, he looked up at me, and I, I saw that he meant to charge, so I yelled to my native boys, lifted my gun, and got him just in time. Oh, 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 oh that's good. <laughs> that's very good. Plugged him. <laughs> and a big fellow, eh? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Son, you had me going there for a minute. Huh. You've certainly got a sense of humor. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see you chasing a butterfly with a gun. <laughs> butterfly? A butterfly? <laughs> it is kind of funny at that, isn't it? <laughs> Mr. Sherwood, Miss Margot's here. Margot? Where is she? Yes, Dad? Uh, come in here, Margot. I've got a little surprise for you. Just a minute. Tony, Tony, my boy. Look, maybe, maybe I'd better see her alone first. Please, now don't deprive me of this moment, son. I want to see the look on her face. Well, so do I, but... Uh... Uh, Stand over there, and don't let her see you. Well, Dan. Margo, my dear, hold on now. Don't fall down. Tony's here. Tony? What are you talking Hello, about? Hello, darling. <gasps> oh, you. It's Tony, your own Tony, darling. Oh. <laughs> Will you please tell me what... Oh, Margo, it's so wonderful to see you again. Kiss me. Oh, uh, Dad, listen. I know, my dear, I know you want to be alone. Oh, no, that isn't don't it. Don't try I... to talk now. I'll be back in just a few minutes. Uh, but, Dad... See you later, son. So long, Dad. <laughs> oh, you idiot. What's this all about? Well, it's very simple. You made up a husband, and I've given him to you. What makes you think I'll take him? Darling, you've got him. Jeff, this is ridiculous. I'm going right in and tell my father that you're an imposter. Okay, you tell him, and I'll show him. You see these cables? These are my proof that you were never married at all and that there isn't any Tony Merrick. Notice the date lines, Las Palmas, Rio de Janeiro? Oh, you, uh, cabled. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, shall we go in and tell Dad? Listen, Jeff, you can't do this to me. Why not? I don't know how many other suckers have fallen for your little act, but you picked the wrong victim this time. Now, listen, you've got to get out of here. Have you the faintest notion of the position I'm in? After surveying carefully, I'd say that you were directly in the shadow of the eight ball. Jeff, will you please do what I ask? No, darling. Listen, there's another reason. There's someone I'm in love with. Deeply in love with, really. You can't be. It's bigger me. Uh, I mean it, Jeff. I've known him all my life. Philip's a fine, sensitive man. You know what it'd make him think. What? Well, he... Well... Oh, Jeff, please get out. It's only me. Can I come in? Of course, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I know I shouldn't intrude, but... I want to tell you I just sent the newspaper men away. Newspaper men? What'd they want? Oh, nothing. Just wanted to confirm the story in their first edition. Oh. Look at this, Tony. This must be your work. Smart set career girl and husband reunite. Oh, very nice, very nice. It's horrible. Dad, did you tell them it was true? Of course I did. You wouldn't want me to lie, would you? Miss Margot, Mr. Booth's here. Oh, Philip. No, Margot, I've just seen the paper. Philip, listen. You can't say a thing like this. We'll sue them for a million dollars. We'll take this case to be... Uh, who's that? Hello. Philip, uh, this is, uh, this is Tony Merrick. And then this last one here. Beautiful specimen, eh, Tony? Oh, yes, a fine state of preservation. Now, the average collector might think this butterfly was just a common papilio turnus. Oh. But, of course, <laughs> we know better. Why, certainly. <laughs> Personally, I don't see how it could be mistaken. <laughs> Was that thunder? Yes. Going to have a storm, I guess. Mm. Well, that's the last of the collection. Now up to bed, Margot. I'm sure it's been a tiring day for both of you. Oh, no, I don't feel a bit tired. Do you, Tony? Well, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, good night, Dad. Good night, my boy. I'm going up myself. But, Father, wouldn't you and Tony like to sit up a while and uh, talk? It's not late. Talk? Why, well, we've been talking all evening. <laughs> Come along now, dear. Mr. Merrick, sir. Yes, Burton? I've put your things in the bedroom, sir. 
Oh, thanks, Burton. Oh, uh, wait, listen, uh, what about a bite to eat? Tony, you must be hungry. Oh, I never eat before I go to bed, never. Uh, a drink, then, I know you, Tony. Oh, sorry, very bad for me now. The doctor's orders, my dear. Well, good night, children. Going to carry your bride across the threshold, Tony? Uh, I certainly am. <laughs> Up you go, dear. Stop it. Put me down. I'm not a bit tired. Good night, Dad. I'll see you in the morning. Night, Margot. Good night, Dad. Put me down. Put me down. There you are, my sweet. Now, listen. This has got to stop. Hmm. That's a nice room. Not bad at all. But I think we ought to change the wallpaper. I don't like Keep this... quiet. You think I'm going to stand for this? Uh, what do you think you're doing? This is a very interesting little process known as man taking off shoes and socks and putting on slippers. And then what? And then I shall retire. Where? Well, now, let me see. Let me see. Uh, behind that screen would be comfortable, I believe. You have two large chairs? No. Now, now, don't make things difficult. If I can't get two chairs, I'll just have to... I'll get them. I'll get them. Uh, thank you. Suppose all this comes under the heading of teaching me a lesson. It's wonderful how quickly you catch on. <laughs> Where are the chairs, please? Oh, you'll have to use the porch furniture. There's a couch out there. You can bring it in. Fine. Say, it's raining. That stuff will be soaking wet. Well, you might go out and see. Very well, my sweet. Good night, my sweet. Hey. Hey, let me in. Let me in. What's the idea? <laughs> have a good rest, darling. I can't sleep out here. It's pouring. Breakfast at seven, darling, but don't get up if you don't feel like it. <laughs> Good night. Well, good morning. Morning, Margot. Morning, Dad. Morning, Tony. Good morning, Dad. <coughs> Pardon me. Oh, caught a little cold, eh? <coughs> Just a little one. <laughs> Had breakfast yet, Father? Oh, hours ago. I just wanted to pop in and see how you were and, uh, and just say, uh, uh, cheerio. Cheerio. <laughs> well, I'll see you two lovebirds later on. Take care of that cold, Tony. Thanks. This has got to stop. We've got to get out of this some way. We? Jeff, please, you've had your revenge. This can't go on forever, you know. What would you suggest, my dear? Well, uh, we'll announce a divorce. Oh, no, we can't. The newspapers would check up and find out it wasn't so. <laughs> Sometimes you make a noise like you're really thinking. So smart, aren't you? All right, we won't fake. We'll get a divorce then. Oh, no, you can't. The law won't let you. Not unless it's been revoked since I looked it up yesterday. Oh, law. What do you know about law? Enough to know that you cannot make a mockery of marriage. All we have to do is just file a suit to... Look, darling, you might as well know right now. You can't run around getting divorces the way you buy hats. Oh, can't I? No, you can't. Not unless you're married. That's the law, so you might as well forget it. All right, if that's it, all right. All right what? If that's the only way to do it, I'll do it. Let's see, we'll have to go to some very out-of-the-way place. Oh, I see. And get a nice little marriage so you could get a nice little divorce. Mm. That's simple. Yes, it'll be a relief to have it cleared up. Yes, it will. Got it all planned out, haven't you? All you have to do is snap your fingers and people hop to your orders. Well, maybe you can push some people around, but not me. When I want to get married, I'll get married, but it won't be to you. What are you talking about? You've got to marry me. <laughs> There's no law on that either. But what's going to happen? I'm not sure yet. But you know, darling, there was once a gentleman named Frankenstein. He created a monster who came to life and make a lot of trouble for him. Well, you wanted to play Frankenstein, so I thought you might as well have a monster. <laughs> Nothing like a nice little monster in the house, is there? <laughs> <laughs> After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille brings back Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Martha Scott for Act Three of Third Finger Left Hand. You know, Sally here fancies herself as quite a poet, so tonight I'm going to give her a real chance to prove what she can do. Oh, Sally, do you remember that rhyming game? Why, I think so, Mr. Ruick. You mean the one... I that... say a line... And I make a rhyme. Right. Let's go. Why, out here in Hollywood... The screen stars know Lux Soap is good. Lux Soap Lather Facials. Work. Um... Oh, remove cosmetics, dust, and dirt. <laughs> well, Sally, uh, I don't think much of that one. <laughs> oh, well, I'll try again. I'll tell our listeners all in rhyme how to take a Lux Soap Active Lather Facial. Now, here we go. 
Pat the active lather in, then you rinse it off your skin. Next, you gently pat to dry. Um, active lather facials try. <laughs> well, Sally tried, and she almost got the whole story into her poem at that, but not quite. For she didn't tell you how wonderfully soft and smooth skin feels after these Lux Soap Active Lather facials. Famous Hollywood stars say... These facials leave skin feeling smoother, looking so fresh. Won't you try this Hollywood beauty care regularly for 30 days? See what it can do for you. Let it help you keep your skin lovely to look at, soft to touch. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of Third Finger, Left Hand. Before a divorce can be granted, the interested parties must be married. In the court of domestic relations, this is a fundamental principle. And Margot has taken her problem to Philip Booth, who in turn has presented it to Jeff Thompson, alias Tony Merrick. I know the whole story, Mr. Thompson, the whole unhappy affair, and I must say it's a very unpleasant situation. Very. Have another drink. Thank you. I've had enough. So have I. Now, look here, Thompson. Doesn't chivalry mean anything to you? How much chivalry do you mean? This isn't the time for flippancy. I've gone all over it legally. You've simply got to marry her. So that she can divorce me and marry you, that makes me the middleman. I'm afraid I can't see myself as a middleman. If you don't mind my saying so, I'm amazed that you're arguing about it. Now, man to man, Thompson. Will you do the decent thing? Man to man, no. Oh, tell me the reason why. Why? Because I'm dope enough to be in love with her myself. Oh. Now, well, down the hatch, old man. Down the hatch. And, uh, just once more, Thompson, let's go over the whole thing. You love her, I love her. It's a problem, isn't it? The thing is, I'm, I'm jealous, Phil. Well, I have a jealous nature, too. Well, who are you jealous of? You. Oh. And I'm jealous of you. Hmm. Well, down the hatch, Phil. <laughs> down the hatch. Uh, now, I got just one more question. I know. Will I or will I not marry the woman you love? The answer is no. Look, Jeff. Just call me buddy. Look, buddy. I got an idea. Now, here's a man named Tony Merrick. The pictures are in the papers, you see? Yeah. And here's a man named Jeff Thompson. Mm. A few weeks, he's going to have an art exhibit. Yeah. Also, pictures in the paper. Yeah. Same face. You follow me? Uh-huh. Then you're going to be in the same spot she is. Mm. Scandal and people laugh at you. You've got to clear this up or go into hiding yourself. Uh, you know something? You're right. <laughs> of course I'm right. Now, you've got to get off the spot and make peace with her. Mm. But where could we go? We've got to be married in a place where nobody would put it in the papers. Ah, no, no, no. I thought of that. I got just the place. Where's that? Niagara Falls. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you go to Niagara Falls to Margo and you mm. get married. Mm. Next day, Margo leaves for Reno. Mm. Okay? Okay. You want to be best man? You think it's the thing? No. 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 No, no. <laughs> I now pronounce you man and wife. My young friends, you're beginning a new life together. Marriage isn't easy. It's a stony road sometimes, and you have to help each other and cherish each other, realizing that no matter what dissensions you have, none of them is worth as much as staying together. The old adage is true, my young friends. It is a lonely life alone. Two by two we marry. And one by one we die. May you both live, not for yourselves, but each only to make the other happy. Congratulations to you both. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Reverend. Good luck to you. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Reverend. Well, that's over. Yes, I, I guess he gives that talk to everybody. No, oh, sure, just a routine. Well, can I buy you a wedding bouquet? No, thanks. We still have four hours till plane time. <laughs> we might as well stroll around and see the falls, I guess. Pretty, isn't it? Uh-huh. I was just thinking, I suppose you will get married someday. I mean, uh, well, most painters do because they're so impractical and they need somebody to look after them. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty practical, you know. Well, at least I've done you some good, showing you what you don't want. Yes, that's right, you have. I guess I've done the same thing for you, too. Well, I never thought my wedding day'd be like this. 
Well, it won't be, you know, not, not the real one. That's right. It won't be, will it? No, yours either. I should hope not. Oh, you should. What's the matter? Oh, nothing, nothing at all, except that as long as we have to spend this time together, you might try to be a little pleasant. I am pleasant. You certainly aren't. You've been snapping at me all evening. You know, when you do get married, you won't need any practice in henpecking. You know that. I was not henpecking. Now, listen. My Aunt Edith killed my Uncle John by henpecking, and I know a henpecker when I see him. Jeff, Jeff Thompson. Well, for the love of Mike. Who's that? <laughs> How are you, my boy? Why, Judge Kellen. I knew it was you, Jeff. Hello, hello, Mrs. Kellen. <laughs> well, this is a surprise. I was down to Wapakoneta just last month talking to your dad and mother about you, Jeff. Is that so? Yes, indeed. We're up here for the convention. Uh, what are you doing here? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Judge Kellen, I... Uh... I was just wondering when Jefferson was going to introduce me. What do you think we're doing in Niagara Falls? Margot. I don't, 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 don't tell me. Jeff, have you really gone yeah, to... Yeah, married, <laughs> say. If you folks aren't occupied, you can lift a snifter with us, you know, wedding party. Listen, you don't... I'm awfully sorry you didn't come sooner. We had champagne, but it's all gone. <laughs> Jeff, have you forgotten your manners? How about knocking me down to the hometown folks? <laughs> oh, well, um... <laughs> This is Kellen, uh, Judge Kellen, this is Margot. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. You know, I know some Kellens run a butcher shop in Brooklyn. Of course, uh, we ain't planning to live in Brooklyn. We're going to live in Wapakoneta, ain't we, Stinky? <laughs> oh, it's... Well, by... Well, uh, congratulations to you both. This certainly is a surprise to us, all right. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, what are we standing around here gabbing for? Come on, Judge, let's go hoist a couple. <laughs> oh! Oh! <coughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. Are you all right, my dear? Uh, here, here, come over here and sit down. Hey, let go, let go. What's a big idea? I beg your pardon? Beg my pardon, nothing. You know what I mean. I'm, I'm perfectly well able to stand up alone, see? If there's anything I don't like, it's a twerp who grabs a lady's arm when she's sober. Oh, well, I, I assure you, Mrs. Thompson, there was no intention of any innuendo. In innuendo? Oh, I like that. I accept the apology. Thank you. Well, we'll, uh, we'll have to be getting along. So nice to have seen you, Jeff. We'll be seeing your family Monday, and we'll tell them we met your bride. Goodbye, Jeff. Goodbye. Well, that was a nice thing to do. <laughs> I think they got the wrong impression, all right. I've got to go back home among those people. You know what they'll think. I'll bet I can guess. Well, that's my hometown. I want to go back there and paint. Don't you realize the position I'm in? Oh. Uh, after surveying carefully, I'd say you were directly in the shadow of the eight ball. Uh, here's a September cover, Margaret. I thought you might want to look in. Thanks, Gussie. And here are those Bryant contracts. They ought to be signed. Leave them on the desk. I'll get around to them later. Margot, is there something wrong? Oh, no, not a thing, Gussie. You should feel very happy now, huh? Everything's settled. You are going to Reno tomorrow with Mr. Booth. A fine fellow, that Mr. Booth. Oh, mm -hmm. And this fellow you are going to divorce, uh, Thompson, he must be a terrible man, what? A mean, selfish troublemaker. He is not. Oh, isn't? No, he... Well, he has his good points. He's a, he's a very good artist. Oh. Gussie, do you think a marriage is hopeless if it gets a wrong start. Huh? Oh, well, that depends on the people. Uh, I guess so. Hello? Oh, hello, Philip. What? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, I see. Well, no, of course it's all right. I won't mind a bit. Yes, Philip, I I'll see you at the train. Goodbye. Oh, Gussie, what do you know about that? Jeff Thompson's going to be on the same train with us. Oh, is that so? Philip had something they had to talk over about the divorce, and that's the only time Jeff can make so it. So he'll be going as far as Ohio with you, huh? Uh-huh, uh, to Wapakoneta. And you'll get the chance to speak with him again. Ah, fine, fine. Gussie, what do you mean? Huh? He's nothing to me, nothing at all. Why, he, he's just... I know. He's a very good artist. <laughs> into all this, Thompson, but after all, you and Margot were legally married, you know. Yes, of course, of course. And since Margot happens to be a person of some, uh, means, why, we have to have a property settlement. Now, this, Philip, uh... we understand everything. Let's hurry up, please. Oh, yes, sir. Now we come to Clause 8. Now, let's see. Whereas the parties having mutually recognized their rights and investigation, whereas the chattels and the properties both real and personal, whereas now they're having a right title payment into those, the other, and whereas the party of the first part making known... Oh, you're the party of the first part, Thompson. Yes, I know, party of the first part. And you're the party of the second part, darling. And you're the party of the third part. Yeah, there is no party of the third part. Oh. And whereas the said party makes known his agreement. 
Now then, I'm not quite sure about Clause 9. Well, just make it uh, Clause 9, whereas. Whereas what? Just whereas. Can I have one clause the way I want it? Uh, I think we can let Clause 9 go. <laughs> so if you just sign here, we won't trouble your trip any further. Oh, that, that, that's all? That's all. Just sign the paper. Uh, goodbye, Margot. Goodbye, Jeff. Here you are, Thompson. Here's the pen. Oh, thanks. Well, what's the matter? Sign it. Uh, I don't understand Clause 4. Well, I just read it to you. Well, it's all Greek to me. I should have legal advice. But I don't know where you expect to find a lawyer at this time of night. Are you denying me the right of counsel? I agree with Jeff, Philip. After all, if he's not satisfied, there might be one on the train. There's always one on a train. I'll have a look. Excuse me, Margot. Be right back, Phil. Oh, Margot, you didn't have to suggest that. I was only trying to be fair. Sometimes I think you want to see that fellow. That's ridiculous, Philip. Oh, oh I'm sorry, darling. What are you thinking of? Hmm? Just now? Nothing much. I was just thinking about houseboats. Houseboats? Yes, you know, houseboats just float along on a river. Sort of a nice idea, isn't it? <laughs> Sounds very messy to me. I wouldn't like it. No, I can't see you in a houseboat, Philip. Sam. Uh, yes, sir. Sam, is there a lawyer on the train? Uh, let me see. No, sir, there isn't. You positive? Yes, sir. But excuse me, sir, are you in need of legal advice? Well, sort of, yes. Well, sir, I've studied law at night school the past four years to improve myself and taken a bar examination. If I could be of service to you. You know about property law? Oh, yes, sir. Well, come into compartment A. You've acquired a client. Yes, sir. <laughs> event, all such properties would be hypothecated. Now, does that suit you, Thompson? I'm not sure. Speak to my lawyer. Uh, all such properties would be hypothecated. Uh, excuse me, sir, but in Indiana Supreme Court Johnson versus Johnson, 1923, if I may cite a case in support of my contention, the ruling was versus hypothecation, completely versus. Oh, all right. Well, Thompson, will you concede clause three in this brief? What do you say, Sam? No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> well, clauses six and seven, will you stipulate us to those? Do we stipulate, Sam? No, sir. We don't stipulate. Now, listen, Thompson. We've been over this thing for three hours. You heard what counsel said. A uh, counsel must be conversing with the ruling in a brief in the Ames case, Wisconsin, 1923. Uh, can I get you another sandwich, sir? No, I don't want another sandwich. I do, Sam. <laughs> if I may suggest, Mr. Thompson, with counsel's permission, it might be wiser if the party of the first part and the party of the second part arbitrated this matter personally. Now, that's a good idea. Margo and I can talk the oh, whole no thing you over. Don't. She's not going to talk to you without me there to protect her interests. Okay, proceed, counsel. Yes, sir. With the sandwich or the brief, sir? Uh, <laughs> the brief. I'll get my sandwich in the club car. Uh, just a minute. Now, you'd better stay right here. Oh, my counsel will take care of everything. After all, you know, there isn't much time. Uh, wake me up early, will you, counsel? Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, Margot. I, I was just going to the club car. Oh, yeah, I was just there. Oh, were you? Yes, I, I just came from there. Oh. Well, it's pretty late. Yes, yes, it, it's pretty late. Yes, it is. I, um, I guess I won't see you in the morning. Huh? No, no, I guess not. We'd better say goodbye now, then, huh? Yes, we'd better. Because the, um... The train gets into Wapakoneta at 8.30, you know. Oh, I thought it was 8.22. Oh, no, 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 8.30. 8 uh, you'll, you'll still be asleep, I guess, huh? Yes, I guess I will. Well, <laughs> good night, then. Good luck, Margot. Good night. Uh, Margot. Yes, Jeff? Margot, I, uh, good night. Good night. Uh, did you call me, ma'am? Sam, come here. Yes, ma'am. Sam, listen. Can you send a telegram for me at the next station? Yes, ma'am. We make a stop in ten minutes. Thank you. I'll give it to you right now. Wapakoneta, sir. Brush you off. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for the legal advice. I, I guess this will take care of it. 
Ten dollars, sir. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. Neither did I, Sam, but at least we tried. Well, here we are, sir. Hiya, Jeff! Hey, Jeff, look at that. You know that. What the? What's all that? Looks like a reception, sir. Mighty fine crowd. Hello, Jeff. Come on down here. Hello, Joe. What's all the excitement Watch here? for you, you old horse thief. For me? What, come I, on, I... come on. Your mother and father are here. Let him through, folks. Let him through. Jeff. Let him through. Jeff, my boy. Hello, Mother. What? How are you, son? Congratulations. Hello, Dad. But congratulations for what? I, I don't Where know. Where is she, Jeff? We want to meet her. We meet who? It was pretty late when we got your wire last night, but we did our best to get a turnout here for you and the bride. Bride? But, but look, I, I didn't send any wire no, about... Of course I... you didn't, darling. I did. Margo. I know how forgetful you are, darling, and I knew you'd want all Wapakoneta to meet us together. Margo. Well, Jeff, when do we meet her? Jeff. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is... This is... Margo, is, is this on the level? <laughs> of course, darling. <laughs> Mother, Dad, my wife! <laughs> The scorekeeper will chalk up two more fine performances as soon as he gets a chance. But right now, we're going to insist that Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. and Martha Scott take a bow. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I should explain to our audience that we were very lucky to catch these very busy young people before they left for parts unknown. Didn't I hear you say, Martha, that you're catching a plane tonight? Yes, I'm off for Washington right after the program, Mr. DeMille. Aren't you leaving tonight, too, Doug? No, not tonight, in the next week or so. But what's going on in Washington? Well, quite a lot, I guess, but I'm going for the premiere of Warner Brothers' One Foot in Heaven on Thursday, and to tell the truth, I'm rather thrilled about it. <laughs> I don't blame you, Martha. I hear some bright reports on your performance in that picture. One Foot in Heaven. Oh, you're lucky, Martha. I can't even get a toehold on heaven with titles like the Corsican Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds very exciting, Doug. And now, Mr. DeMille... I'd like to tell you how much I've enjoyed coming back to the Lux Radio Theater this week. And to be perfectly fair, perhaps I should add that I enjoy using Lux Soap all the time. It's really a wonderful way for any woman to care for her complexion. But I'll bet I can't tell this audience anything about Lux Soap. The, the 90 and 9 may be using Lux Soap, Martha, but we're, we're still after the 100. <laughs> <laughs> what are you planning for next week, C.B.? Unfinished business, Doug. Oh, just... Uh... <laughs> Just tying up a few loose ends, huh? <laughs> no, no, it's something new. Unfinished Business is a brand new universal picture. And our stars will be Irene Dunn and Donna Michi. <laughs> it's the romantic drama of a small town girl who marries a big town boy. And of, of the unfinished business in her life, which uh, he doesn't know about. Gregory LaCava produced and directed the picture... And I recommend it as a very pleasant way to spend part of next Monday night. Well, I certainly won't miss it, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Good night. Come back soon. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents... Irene Dunn and Donna Michi in Unfinished Business. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, an important announcement. The First Lady of the American Theater, Miss Helen Hayes, will return to the air next Sunday evening in the first of a new series of weekly dramatic programs. You'll hear Miss Hayes in a different play every week, favorite plays that she herself chooses. Her first play will be Jane Eyre. Remember the starting date. That's next Sunday, October 5th, over this same network. Check your newspaper for the time. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. will soon be seen in The Corsican Brothers, produced by Edward Small. Heard in tonight's play were Howard McNear as Philip, Ferdinand Munier as Mr. Sherwood, Hans Conried as August, Ernest Whitman as Sam, and Arthur Q. Bryan, Dick Elliott, Charles Seal, 
Helene Costello, Fred Mackay, Lee Millar, Thomas Mills, Una White, Dwayne Thompson, and Leela Himes McIntyre. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.